I'm Stephen Henry Madoff, the founding chair of the master's program in curatorial practice here at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And um, I want to welcome all of you to the final talk in the series for this season called The Algorithmic State, organized by Noam Siegel, the LG Electronics Associate Curator at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, and myself. Uh, today, I'm thrilled to have with us Lev Manovich. Lev is a visual artist, writer, and one of the world's most influential digital culture theorists. He serves as presidential professor in data science and computer science at the Graduate Center City University of New York and a director of the Cultural Analytics Lab. Lev has published an immense corpus of works thinking through issues of technology-based art, the ecology of the art world, and considerably more with over 180 articles and 15 books to his credit, including his ongoing work on the book that's at the core of today's talk, Artificial Aesthetics, A Critical Guide to AI, Media, and Design. Um, I put a link to the book, which you can um, see online, read online, download, and it's in the chat below. His groundbreaking book from 2001, The Language of New Media, was noted as, quote, the most suggestive and broad-ranging media history since Marshall McLuhan. His digital art projects have been shown in more than 100 international exhibitions at such institutions as Centre Pompidou, the ICA London, ZKM, and Chiasma. So Lev is going to talk for about 40 minutes, at which point we'll engage in conversation and Lev will respond to questions from you, from the audience. So please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Lev, we're truly honored to have you with us, and the floor is yours. Okay, I'm starting timer, so we'll okay. go for exactly 40 minutes. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you for this wonderful introduction and invitation to be part of this wonderful series. You know, it's a great time to be in New York. It's the height of the spring season. Uh, so thank you guys so much for making time. And uh, before we start, you know, I moved to New York from California exactly 10 years ago. I mean, I can meet people on the street. People say, Lev, where are you? <laughs> I said, I'm here. And I think I managed to confuse people because when COVID started in 2020, my university asked for faculty to teach on Zoom. So me and my wife kind of went to Korea for three years. And now people are really confused. So regardless of where I am in the world, I'm a New Yorker, I am in New York, and you can always find me here. Uh, well, more precisely, we're going to stay here this time until end of June. So please invite me to your art openings, your parties. Curators can come and do a studio visit with me. And the place where we're staying, even, you know, it's not our apartment, we don't have money to buy it, but uh, it's a long-term like kind of hotel type stay. Yes. There's even a small pool on the rooftop so, uh, you know, uh, up to 29, you know, send me a message and we can go meet up on the pool in the, uh, uh, in the you know, kind of California fashion. Okay. Um, so let me share the screen. Okay, that's great. Um, so the work which I'm going to present and the questions which I'm going to ask uh, come from you know, a particular way I use to respond to the world and can develop ideas, uh, which is social media. Uh, in fact, I'm a peculiar person who did his whole career through web. I created a website in spring of 94 and uh, 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 have been publishing you know, everything online since the time. Uh, and um, uh, you know, when this current, let's say, revolution, and I'm not afraid to use the word revolution, uh, started in the summer of last year. And I started kind of publishing online uh, my notes and also the images I was creating with AI and kind of contrasting them uh, and comparing them to the images I did with traditional media because 
the artists I was trained since the age of 12 when I was studying in Russia. Uh, and then what I do is, right, like everybody else, I have a fear of my page. So once I have enough, so, but I'm not afraid of making somehow the social media post, even though we don't disappear, uh, but with the sense that we can go away, right? With five seconds late, is no longer current. And once I have enough posts, I put it together into a book chapter, uh, but I'm still like afraid, right? Of this kind of commitment to the printed page. And also my last book of my two press, I mean, it really took four years, you know, from, you know, the moment I gave up my manuscript to publication, and obviously four years in the age of generative media, it's like for a million years. So um, um, in 2019, I started to have regular conversations with a wonderful intellectual professor of aesthetics and art in Venice, uh, who lives in Berlin, Emmanuel Ariely. And when I convinced him that we should do online book, so this way we can stay current and we can kind of theorize in real time these exciting developments. And the first chapter was you know, put up at the very end of 2021. And we're kind of wondering if it was a good idea because there's already lots of writing about AI, maybe we missed a boat, but I think it was a perfect moment. Because <laughs> once we kind of got started, right? Once we put out three chapters, you know, when this explosion of, you know, Chat GPT and GPT, right? GPT-4, Midjourney, uh, you know, uh, Stable Diffusion, Adobe Firefly, right? And this kind of summer of generative media happened. So it was perfect. So it took me like a year or two <laughs> Try to, you know, get a sense of it, and I now I'm taking this uh, notes. I'm kind of putting on social media, and then putting them together in, you know, in chapters. So the first chapter was just put out right a few days ago, and I'm hoping in a few weeks I'll have another one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, now, uh, uh, in my sort of work, right, I started working with computers in '84. And I first saw computer graphics in 82, and I had the sense that one day, the deep computer imaging will become as prevalent as ubiquitous as photography. Uh, so uh, my work, I don't really separate it into like writing, theory, and art making. It's basically a way to investigate the new media about time and to have conversation with myself and also to provoke conversation with others. That's why I post everything on the internet and social media. Uh, and uh, because I'm kind of, so I will show you some, some images I've been doing with AI tools in this lecture. And right now I'm sort of preparing uh, what will be a big personal exhibition, uh, which will open next November in Portugal, in the center, and it'll be on for six months. And uh, what you see, right, is a kind of poster for the exhibition. In fact, one of my drawings, ink on paper, uh, which was done around, I think around 82, 82 81 exactly 40 years ago. And uh, the title of the exhibition is Unreliable Memory or uh, perhaps Unreliable Past. And uh, it addresses you know, what I think is one of the many interesting and important questions around the AI generative media uh, that, uh, so now I'm, I'm launching it to the lecture, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, throughout modern history, each new generation of media technology uh, was adopted as a new kind of machine for capturing the presence, storing it, and also let's say giving us access to the past, right? So photography starting in the 1820s, film, uh, later video, both real-time video and tape video. Today we have photogrammetry, you know, uh, 3D imaging, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think now AI is emerging as yet another media uh, which is a mechanism which, of course, already used both in commercial computer animation, commercial films and video games, but also will be used by artists and also will be used, I think, mean, by millions and millions of billions of regular people as a way to kind of recreate or simulate the past. In fact, uh, Asia, which is kind of way advanced of the Western world in the use of AI, uh, like I saw a note that in China, there are already some companies so if you have like a funeral service, right? If you know, a loved one passes away and you order a funeral service, this companies also offer you a kind of like simulated grandfather, grandmother, I mean, using the same, right? ChatGPT or now there's a you know, Chinese versions, right? 
which companies just launched, and you can have a conversation with this grandfather, grandmother. So maybe something like this will happen here, maybe later, maybe not, but this ability to uh, supposedly, right, look into the past uh, and simulate the past, right, joins the previous abilities we had to uh, capture right, photographs, to capture moving images, of course, to digitize written records and the conversations we had for decades about archive and the archives become databases and the qualities of archive and what politics of simulation are now, you know, will be reinvigorated once again. Uh, so yeah, I'll switch to a different part here. Yes. Uh, in effect, um, that's already happening. Uh, so I think uh, if if last summer was a kind of, you know, what was called AI summer in popular press because of explosion, uh, oil, right? Kind of the AI bomb, so to speak, to uh, paraphrase Paul Villiers of all these applications. I think right now we're having kind of like AI spring in New York art world, at least very small one. So both, so the top galleries such as Space and Guy Gaugerian, are showing digital art, and the MoMA, right? MoMA is showing work of Refik Affendal, unsupervised, and uh, in Gagosian, we have exhibition of um, Bennett Miller, documentary filmmaker, and perhaps it's the first exhibition in a kind of blue chip New York gallery, which uses a new generation of AI tools. I think uh, this is using actually an early version of Dali E, and I'm happy that we chose this body of work, right, to show that it's not some generative media, some abstract stuff, or, you know, it's in, in fact, it's, it's exactly what I was talking about a few minutes ago, right, which is this emerging use, abuse, ability, right, um, of, uh, of using AI as a tool to simulate, emulate, uh, reenact the past, right? So in this body of work, Bennett Miller creates this and simulated photographs, which refer to something which could have happened. And uh, now that we have, you know, wonderful people working with galleries, which have degrees, you know, from you know, top places, writing about it, uh, we're also beginning to see, like, I think, very articulate statements about this AI art. Uh, so I like that statement from a press release for Bennett Miller exhibition, which uh, doesn't say that we are going from a revolution in visual imaging, but which says that, you know, we are a, a kind of new revolution, right? A new important moment of debates, right? So as Miller Project acknowledges, such generators already exert a pervasive and non-uncontroversial non influence on um, education, media, and commercial art and design, complicating debates about authenticity, appropriation, style, to a degree not seen since postmodernism 1980s heyday, right? Uh, and what is interesting here with connection to postmodernism, because as I argue in my chapter, this chapter for the book, uh, this new moment of AI tools has a logical and technical connection to postmodernism, as well as early moments in the history of modern media culture, when uh, there was this new accumulation, new technology, a new, let's say, explosion of new abandons, right, of images and historical records. So some people argued, I mean, it's not, I mean, there are lots of explanations for postmodernism, obviously it's not the only one, but some people have suggested that the emergence of this culture of like quoting, pastiche, uh, right, a kind of new level of montage, typical of arts, or many art, many artists and cultural creators in the ages comes from the fact that it was in the way we heard the first generation of artists, which got very systematic kind of art education, they got MFA degrees, and also, you know, we had like access to color slides, right, to kind of color books, I don't know if it's accurate or not, uh, but uh, in a way enough culture was already translated and made available through color photographs, you know, color slides, films you can see like in the film library and this creation right of this kind of databases and contemporary language of past culture is perhaps what led to this historicizing imagination again i have no idea if it's a true or not it's hard for me to say but definitely this is what we see today right so the development of uh, generative media is only possible 
today, as opposed to 15 years ago, because 15 years ago, there was not enough culture digitized and not enough, let's say, cultural producers, artists, designers, illustrators, you know, you know hundreds of millions of people uh, posting their stuff on Instagram, uh, deviant art, and our uh, professional or semi-professional sharing websites, it was not quite rare, right? Uh, this professional sharing website such as Behance only began around 2007, right? And after 10 years, this wealth, right, of human culture imagination, as text, as images, as video, is available online, and then it becomes possible to train a huge neural network with data, and the networks miraculously learn how to simulate with let's say, creativity or with artifacts and thousands of styles and create new ones. Uh, and in which chapter I also talk about, let's say, our earlier moments. Um, such as, let's say, 1910, 1920s, right, the development, the emergence of kind of photo collage and photo montage, uh, which, um, and also the whole new visual language of modernism, you know, typography, design, which is partly was a response to, uh, right, in another moment of this, let's say, uh, visual explosion uh, with magazines such as time, uh, walk, and hours, beginning in 1910, 1920s, in this abandonment of images in popular press and posters. And uh, this leads, I think, potentially, this can be seen being reflected in cubism. Uh, you know, Lisitsky, Rochenko, uh, Eisenstein, Vertev, and so on. Like, right? An early attempt to make art out of this abundance of media. Right? So, I, so I like this kind of and I want to continue this historicizing way to place uh, contemporary AI media uh, in this historical context and to say that one way to see it, and this is not a way to explain it completely, but one way to see it is to think of it as another moment in this history of modern art, culture, and industry. When with a new type of accumulation, new technology of accessing, printing, sharing, uh, becomes available and uh, with new media and also new artistic response. So again, I haven't seen an exhibition yet. I may go tomorrow, now that I'm in New York, but I think this speaks to it. Okay, so a couple of more things. So as I said, you know, this press release from Gagosian you know, was very smartly pointed out that uh, we'll have this new round of debates, but I'll be a bit more bold, since that's kind of what I'm supposed to do as a theorist of history, visual culture. And uh, I will say that as of now, it does appear uh, that with AI generative image or AI generative media, technology uh, is perhaps as important as other major technologies of representation, which came before. Of course, it's possible that tomorrow something completely new will be invented. The prompt interface will go away, uh, but uh, it seems to me that these technologies are already so powerful, both in terms of text generation, you know, music generation, image generation. So while in the future we may see different interfaces, perhaps we will not be using text to describe images, we'll be using images to describe images and maybe 3D models and something else. And we already have that, right, right? Image to image models. Um, it does seem to me that something major happens. So this is one of many potential timelines we can put together. It's of course possible to criticize. And the reason I cannot put in front of you this very ambitious in both timeline, it's just a way to start conversation. Uh, and of course we can include many, many more stages, but let's say roughly speaking, we have printing, right? You know, I think we'll, I think the earliest cave images of hand go back around now 130, 130,000 years BC and also drawing, right? These images of animals. Uh, and then we have lens assisted imaging, uh, camera obscura, camera lucid photography. Um, so historians say we can find first camera obscura type devices already 500 years BC. Even we have different generations of photography, right? Photography is not one media, photography is a collection of different media, which do have something in common like lens. Uh, so there's a particular, right, one point perspective, but everything else is different. So we have, let's say, analog photography. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I was just modifying it. Sorry, what I meant was that it's actually around 1810s. 
digital photography, let's say around 1990s, computational photography, I'm not sure exactly when it starts, but I would say maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and then I think another major, major thing is 3D computer graphics, right? The ability to specify the image using its some kind of mathematical model coordinates and then render uh, photorealistic images, also moving images. And then we have a current stage of the current technology, which is AI generated image, uh, which is basically stands for deep neural networks uh, trained on uh, large or not so large databases. For example, if you're using GAN models, about 1500 images is enough. You don't need to have 5 billion images as you do for stable diffusion. And that begins almost 10 years ago, around 2014, with the generation of realistic faces, and then explodes today. And as you know, last year was this explosion of ability, or explosion or this emergence of ability to generate uh, realistic still images. And this year, I think by the end of the year, we'll start seeing lots of animated films uh, because the tools to generate video and animations are also developing. So one more, uh, another slide, right? So trying to kind of go back, you know, go back and forth between some fact and some theory, right? Not developing full theory, but putting lots of ideas for discussion. So the interesting questions, of course, for us, the like historians and critics, and also artists, how do we call these new images, right? So if you look at the you know, popular coverage, which of course exploded over the last few months, and this is just from last, Paul, uh, you know, images, right? But what are these images? Well, generated media, uh, but what else? So we can call this AI image. I think that's okay. Uh, we can call it generated image. The problem with the term generated image is that there has been other things which already been called generative, right? So when people use algorithms in the 1960s to create first algorithmic art, that's now also called generative. So in the last four or five years, auction houses such as Sarovis and Philips started to have these regular auctions of generative art where we put together some young people doing algorithmic work using NFTs next to you know, the older generation of people who started to first to make generative images in the 60s. Um, so generative image term is also used for algorithmic image in general, which is a larger category. And also uh, 3D computer graphics can be also called generated image because you basically tell the computer how to generate images, right? So the term generated image, it's a good one. And obviously I'm not going to tell people not to use it, but it's also a bit problematic. So another term which perhaps we can use will be latent image. And this may get a bit technical, some of you, I'm going to lose immediately some of you, most of you, but uh, basically the term latent image comes from this idea that the way the network represents something, such as patterns across you know, billions of images or trillions of web pages on this latent space, this parametric space. I can explain it, but I would need 20 minutes, <laughs> which I don't want, which I don't have. Uh, but technically, that's what it is. Another term which I can suggest, which is close to my heart, is meta image. And this goes back to my uh, one of my previous books, Software Takes Command, uh, 2013, where I basically claim, following Alan Kay, uh, the guy who ran the lab at Xerox Park in the early 70s, where we invented modern kind of multimedia graphics computer. And Alan Kay was already writing in his articles in the early 70s that computer is not just the media, but metamedia. Right? So the computer can simulate almost all or many existing media, right? and you, know, you can also program new ones. right? So already in the 70s, in this early right, uh, graphics media computer, which we created, there was a paint program, right? so you can kind of paint, yes, in black and white, but paint. Uh, not than 60 million colors like later. You can draw uh, later, you have, have AutoCAD, you can compose music. So this idea with computer is not just another media, but computer is a meta media. In fact, I take it from inventor of this computer, which is Alan Kay. But uh, I think that generative media definitely continues in the same, you know, the same paradigm, except 
today, not only AI can generate thousands of different styles uh, and thousands of different kind of languages of different artists with more or less success, but it also has a knowledge of cultural content. So it's a kind of metamedia, you know, stage two. But I think the terms which are actually, I think the best ones would be statistical image and or pluralistic image. And it turns out that the term statistical image was already used by right, French media theorist Paul Virilio in his 1994 book in relation to computer vision. Uh, and I think it works very well, right? Because it's images, uh, so I'll just okay, I'll put one of my own images, right? Done with the journey, I think it was yeah, maybe around September of last year. So these images do not exist, right? So if you put it in the Google image search, you will not find anything exactly like this. And this image um, is a kind of statistical probabilistic object uh, which computer generates interpolating between everything which exists. So if you imagine this huge space, which has billions of images which come from a web, from Pinterest, from Instagram, from all the galleries around the world, everything which was digitized, the high art, low art, uh, what the computer does is kind of predicts the image in relation to a prompt. Uh, and let me take 10 seconds to actually explain this technically because I think that's an important point. Right, so the way uh, this current generation of neural networks is trained, as some of you know, is very trained not just on images, but they're trained on the pairs of images and, and text. Right, so you go and you download you know, billions of images from the web, uh, where web designers right put descriptions of the images for people who don't see, for blind people, and you use this. And when you train the computer to figure out association, right, which image and which text go together, so you basically train the computer to statistically right can associate images in this text. And then when you give computer a new prompt, right? So the prompt here was something like uh, a large painting uh, by 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 Bosch on the wooden panel on the wooden panel of Russian uh, futuristic city designed for Siberia in 1965. <laughs> Obviously the image like this doesn't exist. So what the computer does is that it says, aha, uh -huh, but I already know, like I already have knowledge of billions of image descriptions and you know, image descriptions and images. So this is the description, what image would correspond to the description, right? So this is why I think this knowledge of statistical and probabilistic image is quite good. Okay, so now uh, let me make a couple of, or at least, or at least one argument, uh, actually looking at these images more closely and talking about what I think is for me personally, it's also creator, right? The person who uses these images is perhaps the key, the most important aspect of generative media so far. And it's discussed, but maybe it's not discussed enough. So the static bias and, and feedback loops. Okay. So although we're trained on very large and diverse data sets, some or perhaps all, but definitely some. AI image generation tools, such as New Journey, Stable Diffusion, and endless others, have strong aesthetic and content biases. Okay? Uh, so if you have right more experience as an artist, or maybe you know you've been working going to museums all your life. In my case, right, I started to be trained in art at the age of 12, so it's 50 years. I can kind of bend mid journey stable diffusion to make something which is more like my sensibility, my style, my visual language. And I will show you examples in a second. But even when I feel I'm successful in doing it, when I look later at these images weeks, months later, like I'm not sure that it's full success because with aesthetic biases, uh, this kind of built in what mid journey CEO called house style may still show up, okay? Uh, so this is the examples, right? So a way to test it, if you're using these tools yourself, uh, for example, open something like Midjourney and just give it a very simple prompt. 
So this was, I think, done you know, a couple of months ago it's before version five. Uh, but you, know, you can basically go. So it was I said sphere, and I said version four. It was I think done just with the spirit when the version four came out some months ago. Now you can do version five, and you get something like this. Okay, so this is not a bias. And again, I'm not sure. I don't like the word bias. It's overused, but it's what everybody understands. Uh, okay, I think house style is a better term. But let's say this is not a bias. Then what is right? So you would expect maybe you get some kind of black and white. I don't know, drawing of a sphere, or maybe just a line, maybe some academic 19th century you know, shaded sphere. Instead, you get this whole universe, right? Which is very dramatic, very Hollywood, very video games, very Baroque, very Rococo, if you want, right? <laughs> it's a kind of rock, yeah, it kind of gives us Rococo, and it's very satisfying. So, you know, find one of like, you know, 20, 30, uh, 20, 30 million people already today using these tools. And I actually have no drawing ability, or I'm not even good with photography. And I type something like this, and I get this, it's very satisfying. And I don't want to call this like a false creativity, right? I don't want to bring this kind of like pseudo Marxist language, say, you know, it's ideology. Yes, for this person, it feels very good. Because for one thing, this person types something and you get something, as opposed to when you go to your boring work and your boss tells it to do something, you know. Uh, so, but of course, from a point of view of you know, cultural history, but it's not particularly creative, and the creativity is really comes from a computer uh, and from you know wonderful, very small team at Midjourney which designed these tools, right? Uh, so, so you think, okay, Lev, what about sky? So, what should be the default image of sky, right? That's what you get. And you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of struggling to find out exact terms how to describe it, and uh, I did. Um, uh, I did told my MA students, I only have one student right now, uh, to uh, say, can you like maybe write like a thesis? She was looking for thesis topic, right? Which would kind of place uh, this both like this mid journey typical imagery we see, right? All these cute characters and so on, but also this default language within the history of kind of each, which is a particular, right? Cultural paradigm. I think uh, traced usually to Germany and 19th century, but she doesn't have enough background, but I'm really hoping somebody will do it, right? So I'm basically trying to figure out the language for this, right? It's never, you can't just say Hollywood, you can't just say video games. It's a kind of photorealistic, but with actually artistic render, but it's definitely very, very dramatic. In fact, last summer, when the CEO of Midjourney was kind of pressed in one of the interviews, she said, what is this house style? He kind of, he didn't want to answer, right? Uh, and then he said, well, you know, if you basically leave it to its own devices, if you don't specify colors, you're going to get something which is orange and blue. And of course, orange and blue is what is used in Hollywood, typically to colorize most films, because this combination really works, right? Um, anyway, so here's the business. I just took one of the images larger. But now let me uh, talk about a different kind of bias, uh, which is built in a stable diffusion. Yeah. So stable diffusion, which is, you know, probably most important you know, networks because it was released last August as open source and there are, you know, endless customizations. So, so lots of people are using it, customizing it, training on brain data sets, uh, was trained on uh, a data set uh, uh, called Line uh, containing 5.8 billion image and text pairs scraped from a web. And uh, again, without going technical detail, uh, you know, this training right takes place over a few months. It's lots of you know, lots of like uh, it's like cooking, right? It's not just a formula, but they have to try lots of things. So we basically train it on one subset of the data set. I think I have it open. Uh, here it is. You can actually go and read about it. Just a moment. Uh, yeah, here it is. You can read about it, all the details. Uh, and then um, it was fine tuned, right? So the last stage of training took place on a particular subset of the data set uh, called line aesthetics. And we're going to discuss it, right? Because it's actually online and we can see what's going on. So let me explain to you, right? So here it is, you can go, you can check it out and kind of make your own conclusion. I'll just show a few slides for speed purposes, right? Okay. 
So let me explain to you what it means. Around 2005, 2006 actually, the computer scientists start a new area of research in computer science called computational aesthetics. And the idea was to use lots of images, which in 2006 meant a few hundred thousand, uh, which already have some kind of aesthetic ratings. So that was before Instagram. But you had, for example, a website which was uh, used by photographers. The photographers would put photographs, and other photographers would rate them on a scale of 1 to 10. So, right, so 1 is worse, 10 is best. You know, and many computer scientists figure out we can download these images and the ratings, right, and then try to kind of program the computer, try to create algorithms which would predict these ratings. And it was actually before neural networks, it was deterministic algorithms. And more or less it worked. In fact, what we found out is that, uh, you know, the correspondence was that, you know, like 80% or 90%. So it actually turns out, contrary to Kant and uh, the whole tradition of aesthetic philosophy, but in fact, uh, you can actually predict to a certain extent uh, the aesthetic ratings, you know, of both like normal users, right? People who didn't go to art schools and also professional photographers. And then uh, once people started using deep network after 2013, these predictions became even better. So this is what's used to create this uh, stable diffusion model. So what we do is that, I mean, there are multiple stages, but basically what we do is that we take, uh, so we take, right? So let's say we take like a few hundred, we take 23,000 images and we give them to a set of users. And these people like rate with images, one, five, 10. And then using these ratings, we train a neural network. And then we apply this neural network to the rest of the images. So this aesthetic data set, I think it's something like 500 or 800 million images, which was automatically rated by neural network to simulate the ratings of normal people. And of course, there's normal people as the uh, you know, the lab itself points out, you know, represent not some, you know, diverse or universal average humanity. You know, it's mostly white, it's mostly people with some technical degrees, we didn't get trained to school. So it's a, it's a particular type of popular imagination, popular Western imagination. And, you know, we're aware of it. And we say we're going to prove it in the further version. But for now, that's what it is. So let's now see what are these ratings. Because I think uh, it's not so easy to make a direct connection between what, this, what the computer thinks is more or less aesthetic and uh, what we get, right, in neural networks, but I think there's some connection, okay? So these are the images which get rated close to zero, right? Uh, so we can see it's basically something which can random scrape from the web, right? we are not really photographs, usually text, and they're not designed, right? It's not Bauhaus or this you know, school, you know, not really design. So when we keep going down, and again, you can do the same thing online, but you can do the same thing online, but I'm just showing you slides to easy to make it easy to understand. Right? When we go to like three, 3.7, so now we start getting something which has composition with two variety of images. And, uh, but let's say we see emergence of certain, I would say what I would call meta features of modern, visual communication or art, right? Uh, I actually have it written down, right? Uh, and then uh, we keep going, so it's graphic design, right? And then we get to five and six, which is very high rating. So now we have photography, you know, and we get very particular, right? Commercial photography with very particular features. And then you say, yeah, but what about paintings? Where are the paintings in the data set? So we keep going, right, to the kind of end, right? I think we're highest rating was seven, and now we start getting, right, both contemporary kind of commercial photography in different genres, you know, models, portraits, and certain paintings. So it's very interesting how they're associated. And this is like, this is the last part of the data set. Let me kind of read my interpretation. Let's look at the examples of images from line data set with aesthetic ratings. Images on the top have lower ratings, close to zero. And as you scroll down, ratings get higher. Uh, the, the progression in image rating, as I see it, 
are images rated by the static models and based originally on people ratings of images and, and model design to predict them are kind of graphic design. So graphic design is called as less aesthetic, let's say by uh, the mass space in our society, which is quite interesting. Uh, product, portrait, and other commercial photo genres, and then popular paintings. Now, does this reflect contemporary popular taste? So does it mean that people presumably without any art or art theory training, think of popular paintings as most aesthetic, commercial photos as less aesthetic, and graphic design is the least aesthetic or pleasing, right? Apparently for many people, aesthetic is associated more with fine arts. So we can see what this is really ideological judgment and not simply you know, based on colors, composition, so on, right? So for many people, we think obviously, right, but painting or particular painting is more aesthetic than photography or any other visual genre. So what else can we see with images? Because, you know, uh, you asked me, right, yesterday when the chat lab, you have to really define artificial aesthetics. And uh, I don't have one definition, uh, but I think maybe here we can see potentially what this term can mean. So maybe artificial aesthetics refer to this, what I would call meta aesthetics or super aesthetics, this kind of very basic DNA of contemporary visual culture, which I then gets built in into the, into the generative media tools, which then start showing up, right? In the kind of images, you know, people creating these tools, and then uh, with this feedback loop. So I was trying to think about, you know, what is what are these images? Well, many of them have clear perspective lines leading to the key object of interest. It's what in photography called money shot. This is one of the most common compositional techniques in photography recommended in the tutorials. And we have something I would call commercial look. This applies to 19th century painting or even 17th century painting today and photography. So again, it's like meta aesthetics, it's not based on genre. Uh, I think that, uh, again, you know, there are lots of people with visual knowledge in the audience. So I hope you will help me and we can talk about it. But what I would say, these images are clear, they high contrast. Um, they are uh, mm, high saturation, energetic, easy to read and efficient. So easy to read and efficient, easy to grab and working well as a, as a small image, right? As a snapshot is maybe what's important. And uh, I would say that the opposite, you now it's the examples of what I've called visual communication, which of course, platforms like Instagram made even more central. And they opposed to a certain right powerful tradition uh, of modern art, uh, which various critics have written about, uh, and there have been some exhibitions, which I would define, which I would call undefined, unclear, unfocused, chaotic, and random. So perhaps this overall meta aesthetics is what gives AI generated images very typical clean, dramatic, high contrast, high situation look, and where particular uncanny, too pretty, too beautiful, too clear, too well done aesthetics. And uh, I'm sure you've seen one, but uh, just to remind you. Uh, one good place to kind of see it would be, uh, sorry, would be, okay, would be here. So this is one of many uh, websites, resources, where uh, uh, people uh, collect the examples of styles or artist names, which uh, tools like Mid Journeys are good at. So for example, we have uh, you know, 537 painters uh, and where are we? Why? Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm not. Maybe it's not loading. Okay, if it's not loading, we will go to this one. So this is an hour one, right? So where are these kind of stretches around where people would have put together like thousands of artist names taken from Wikipedia, even show you what, what Mid Journey of Stable Diffusion do if you put with artist names. Uh, and, uh, you know, at first it looks very convincing, but then as I discuss in more detail in my chapter, sometimes you get something which in fact is like the style or visual language of particular artists. Sometimes you get something else, but with certain, even I can hear, so when you put these artist names or illustrators names, it's a way to maybe overpower, right? This uh, commercial meta aesthetic bias, but there is still 
something is too clear, too focused, too centered. We're still perhaps with commercial look, but of course, you know, it's something to be discussed. So I think I'm on to uh, 40, let's see, yes, 42 minute mark. But uh, if I can just take literally two minutes, what I'll do is very briefly just to show you uh, my own attempts to uh, my own struggles, right, with tools, uh, having understood both practically and perhaps conceptually, you know, how powerful are these biases or how styles are uh, trying to do something else. And as many people pointed out, you know, the version three of mid journey was more poetic. It was not as realistic. Uh, it didn't understand you as well. Uh, so in a way it was a bit like modernist artists, uh, not on purpose, making sometimes something which was not really defined, whereas the subsequent versions become more realistic. Um, and it's very really good at generating something which already existed and very kind of harder to use if you want to do something poetic. So um, and here are some examples, right? So let's say this is like, I took one of my drawings, you know, from my early twenties, right? This kind of East European late communism, uh, absurdist, terrorist image. And I said, well, you know, we have these networks. We've been trained on almost 6 billion image text pairs. Can we draw in my style, right? So using technique, which is, you know, called in painting, we basically erase part of a drawing. And when you tell the network to try to continue, it can't. And this is not because my images are amazing or not, I think, <laughs> uh, and uh, they're so unique, but they're unique enough, right? They're unique enough that the network at this point, at least about additional training, fails. And that's what you get, right? So uh, you get something like this, right? which I think is kind of awful. Right? So it, it uh, tries to emulate my type of indeterminacy, right? Uh, absurdity the way I draw this object, but these objects are still, you know, even though they draw badly, so to speak, from academic point of view and purpose, we are very concrete, right? This is like a shoe, this is some kind of bird on the string, you know, like an imaginary theater, but that's what I got from, you know, my journey, and I try every month, and it doesn't get better, uh, right? Of course, what I can do is I can play tricks, but they're very dirty tricks. I can say, I'm going to raise the sky and say, can you like draw the sky in the style of Rembrandt? And when I get something like this, which is much nicer, but I wouldn't dare to call this my own artwork. Uh, anyway, so just show you a few things. Uh, I know uh, I'm beyond my time, but I will limit it to, let me see what the time is. Yes, I will limit it to uh, uh, two minutes. Um, so this was, you know, like many other people, right, including so many of my Russian friends in Russia or immigrants, you know, designers, architects, artists, intellectuals, I felt very frozen, you know, you know, kind of emotionally very, sort of, in a way, confronted, right, by the developments of Wall Street. So this is how I felt. So this is my attempt to create this atmospheres. Again, this is Last Falls. So it's a mid journey of stable diffusion. Uh, sometimes things happen because of accidents. So here I wanted to create an image of like uh, photographs, like, floating in space and instead, and I think I said like, you know, pages of book are floating like uh, clouds in the sky and my journey misinterpreted me in a wonderful way. And I got this kind of photo books, it was imagining photo books of clouds. So uh, AI has its own ways of misunderstanding you. It's all way of creating chance and often that the images happen like this. Uh, and then this is, uh, again, this was last summer, early fall, uh, thinking about the war, thinking about the future. So this is called Russia after the long war. Uh, and here again, to try to get away from this more commercial, kind of very money shot aesthetics with these tools, with a parameter you can change, which basically tells the AI to listen to you, but not too much and to make something else. So I got something else, again, trying to get away from this more realistic aesthetic of video games I was getting. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so this is another series, Rush After the Long War. So here I decided to play a little bias. I noticed that every time I would put Russia in my prompts, immediately the journey would start drawing some churches, or sometimes Kremlin. I said, okay, I'm just going to leave it, right? As opposed to try to fight it out, I'm going to leave it and make it like a part 
of my content. So this was another, I think, so, so one strategy, right? Try to con completely get rid of this bias and do something else. And now is to incorporate it, right? Uh, and then uh, this is, so sometimes you make something, you like you don't know what it is. So I decided to do these illustrations for some hypothetical novel, uh, like George Orwell type of novel, right? A type of anti-utopia, which could be written maybe in the 30s, 40s, or 50s, maybe in Portugal or one of many dozens of European countries, which were under military dictatorship at the time. And I can imagine the whole story with this type of dictatorship where children or teenagers become dictators for a month. And then like, you know, children sometimes, right? Uh, you know, um, have different sense of morality, perhaps. So we're putting photographs of our friends and trying to like, get them. Uh, so I thought maybe this is illustrations for non existing novel I can write. Uh, and then, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and then again, trying to get away from this you know, very saturated uh, color aesthetics. Very happy to make things like this. And also going back to my childhood, Generating images for this kind of Khrushchev, right? This uh, socialist housing, uh, which was built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And the question which I keep asking, well, you know, is this really me, right? Can I use this tool to do something uh, which I was doing uh, 30, 40 years ago, or are these biases really controlling, right? And uh, just to show you very briefly, right? So I went back to drawing after 30 years. I'm not doing it, which is like the first drawing I did. It was the second, this was last summer. It's the second drawing I did in the paper. And it was the third drawing I did. And uh, I keep going back and forth, right? And trying to think about, uh, sorry, trying to think about, uh, you know, uh, right? What are, right? What are these things, right? What are these things I'm generating? with uh the journey uh is it me is it fake me is it simulated me so what happens anyway i think uh i hope i sketched some problematics and sorry of course i went over 50 minutes i apologize and i'll stop here thank you fantastic Lev. thank you so much um i'm just going to begin by um the obvious fact we're all here, we're thinking about this because generative AI seems so eruptive, disruptive, transformative. And um, Lev and I had been speaking before, before the talk and it, it generated for me a particular question, particularly because you said today you started the talk by saying a very interesting, provocative thing about how this this new tool, this new kind of platform captures the past in a tradition that can go back 130,000 years, whatever it is. But as I would say, certainly since photography, one of the most remarkable technologies to do that. So I wanted to think about that um, with you for a moment in a particular context, which is our, our own um, emotional lives and subjectivity when we see these new kinds of images. And, you know, I, I noted that in the new chapter of the book, and again, um, the link is in chat for everybody for the book, um, you write that artistic AI, as you call it, is producing, quote, genuinely new cultural artifacts with previously unseen content aesthetics or styles. So that raises for me um, the question of in the context of being an artist, being a curator, being a viewer of art, um, now that we can produce these new cultural objects on a massive scale, um, they're nonetheless being introduced into a human context in which human nature, as you put it, hasn't changed at all. And so what does that mean? Uh, what does it pretend? How do we think about the fact that we have accepted um, and daily formations of our own subjectivity and now we're confronted with something that is fundamentally different, is fundamentally new? Yeah. Uh, 
I'm just trying to think about how to. I can't answer this, of course, in a few minutes, but okay. right. Raise up, up to your wonderful question. Um, so I think uh, I would say just one thing, and among many things I could have said. I think one, maybe for me, product way to see this new development, and I kind of hinted on this in the beginning of the talk, is to see it as another type, as yet another, let's say, another incident in the series, you know, which we had in human history many, many times, of this arrival of new communication, let's say, communication. <laughs> we hate this word, but communication technology, which creates this new abundance, right? of media, information, data, knowledge, and many changes culture, right? So I mentioned maybe perhaps 1980s artists like trained on color slides and films and libraries and we start making this art, which has had lots of quotes. Again, I'm not sure it's a good, it's, it's the right idea, but there's something to it. Uh, net artists in the late 90s, right? Also creating art out of uh, abundance of stuff on the net. 1910, 1920s, artists, uh, photographers, right, photo montage people uh, creating art out of this new abundance of visual culture. Uh, we can go back to, right, uh, 16th century or 15th century Gutenberg Press. Uh, uh, sometimes it's new technology like oil paints, which allows people, right, in the end of 15th century make this huge painting, which was its own, its own majority. So there are these moments, right, and uh, in my case, you know, uh, this interpretation is particularly relevant because I spent kind of 15 years doing what I call the right cultural analytics, which is trying to create uh, or advance uh, tools for visualization of large image collections starting in 2005, right? And when I created the lab of California, and eventually I had this book of MIT Press, uh, and there are like 45 projects we've done in the lab where we'll take like 1 million pages of manga books and say, how can we see it? Or well, we'll, we'll take over, you know, over 900 plus minus paintings of one block and see how we can see it as a progression, right? And I think it was interesting, you know, it hasn't become like a mass movement, but I'm hoping eventually these tools will become normal for art critics, art historians, museums. So this new explosion, right, of millions of people generating images with tools, it already joins the early explosion which was of Instagram, we're now a type of explosion when museums digitizing millions of images. And uh, uh, the last thing I want to say, what, as you know, what's key for me in this is the issue of reliability and diversity, right? Uh, does do the tools in earlier moments, you know, Instagram, you know, digital media, globalization, global travel, all this key tech of social cultural development over the last 40 years, since the moment I came to America, right, to the West in 81, do all this techno social, techno social cultural development, do we make the world more diverse or less diverse? Right? So that's why, for example, now I think about visual bias, because on the one hand, it seems like you can do endless amounts of different things with tools, but when we did small statistical analysis of what people were actually making with me journey on Discord servers last fall. Like for example, most of this artistic media were not used. So most images were like painting or photography and with no gravure, I mean, no pastels, et cetera, right? So we have these amazing tools which potentially can allow for incredibly diverse world. And yet uh, what we see often, right, is that it's a world dominated by a small number of ideas. It's a world dominated by a small number of styles. It's this, imagine, it's this universe of mid journey which potentially can be everything and can have lots of stuff I've never seen before, but the reality perhaps is less diverse than you would get like a normal art museum. Mm. Um, so that's, um, so the question is, you know, if human nature indeed doesn't change that much, uh, obviously I'll kind of, right? Uh, I mean, human IQ was actually growing throughout the 20th century, right? But it's, uh, whereas research, but it seems like to slow down around 86. Uh, anyway, uh, I think how do humans respond to this, to this abundance of content, right? Abundance of possibilities. Do we respond by, in a way, not uh, creating tools, mechanisms, and art, which is truly diverse? Uh, and what I want to say is, you know, with diversity, you know, right? So I just came from a digital art jury where people were like looking, right, at the identity of all the artists. 
And of course, right, bringing this identity culture moment, so we say we want to have people which are from different continents and from global south and from you know, this and this and that. But that's different thing when to say, do we actually create different content? Yeah. And people may be diverse in terms of their biography identity, but do we also offer diversity of aesthetics content? And that's, like, I would say, my, <laughs> at least at this festival, I, I came out a little depressed, right? Anyway, so the issue is that, of course, we have tools, right, such as Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, which potentially can lead to this kind of renaissance of craft uh, and uh, something which is really would be beyond modern, but what we, what we may get perhaps is something opposite. Sorry for my long yeah. answer, but the question was no, like I really, mean, you know, know five-mile question. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it occurs to me that, you know, what you're talking about, and by the way, we're not only talking about text to image generators, we can be talking about chat GPT, right. et cetera, the, the production of many, many different kinds of expression. Um, but it's starting with the idea that a data set is something that is produced from human creations to begin with. And, mm -hmm. you know, that the notion that I'm talking about of, okay, in the present, will there be some sort of transformation that may take place because of this huge new form of of expression um because and this relates to one of the questions that um one of the audience has posed you know it is a black box we don't know what it makes exactly uh, we don't understand why but it, it raises the question for me which i had noted before um is the computational device the artist is the coder of the computational device the artist mm -hmm. Is the person who writes the prompt into the interface the artist, um, or in an etymological sense of the Latin creare, which means to beget, to produce? Who, who is it that is the get, um, begetter of, of these new cultural objects? Is it, in fact, some sort of global, potentially global collective maker? Mm -hmm. gets rid of the idea of the author which is something that of course for a long time with uh Bart, uh you know and Foucault who asked about the death of the author we're having the question of copyright and therefore of the author again which is to say that the contemporary idea or the western idea of the me of the I that makes is now being possibly transformed by this new tool. So looking into the future, where sure. we're speculating about um, general artificial, artificial general intelligence, which is more sentient, which is self-aware, which sparks the idea of autonomy and agency, that device, these devices may be creating their own content that do not originate in a data set made by humans. Mm -hmm. And they are making their own uh, their own memories, so to speak, their own capturing of a, a past that is not human. I'm wondering, I know this is a huge speculation also, but I'm wondering what you think about it. Okay, I'll try to be really brief. Um... So, um, so one thing, right? So, as to know, we're living in a, a kind of global culture which uh, operates using kind of romantic idea of the artist, artist, genius, human being who pulls out these amazing things out of his or her imagination, and that's why, right? The art discourse always downplay the technology. Right, because it's like, oh, turns out you know, you're actually cutting other people, like, right? Like, turns out your text is just a set of quotations from other text, like Ronald Bart pointed out. What a scandal! Turns out that you're actually using different media, and that's why photography had to wait 150 years for its acceptance, right? And I think that's why other forms of technological art, like you know, algorithmic art or generative art, you know, so also not accepted because, in fact, it does question this romantic idea, and there are multiple reasons, right, why this need of art, that art is superior to our kind of visual practices, right? Uh, and the artist is this embodiment of creativity as opposed to, I don't know, pizza maker, right? Or 
Uber driver who's trying to navigate, you know, New York traffic, right? It's also very creative, right? What is so special about artists, uh, given that today artists have better education and no skills mostly, right? Like why, why we put on pedestals? Um, so I think that as long as we continue living like in this paradigm, I think where our world will just eat up with technology and we'll just say, okay, it doesn't matter if you're using, you know, with generative media tools, the artist is the artist, you know, because it have, you know, we, the, the art world in a good sense, I like the art world uh, today more than ever, it's better, it's better than digital art world. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll just eat it up and figure out a way to kind of neutralize it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my sort of prediction. Uh, uh, because, you know, there are too many museums, too many kunsthalists, too many biennialists, the system is profitable to everybody symbolically, financially, and, you know, it doesn't want to question itself. And, you know, we know that in the 20th century, the history of art is taking something which is outside of art and then making it part of art and making it into a sellable object, whether it is Duchamp, right? Uh, Duchamp, yes, all made or, you know, basic editions of digital prints. We, of course, also makes no sense to make an addition if it's algorithm, right? Um, the second thing is, uh, so that was, a, that was the first thing I want to say. The second thing I'm going to, going to say, I forgot, which is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Uh, the second thing, yeah, the, the, second, uh, the second thing, no, sorry, I, yes, I did forget, but that's good. So you can ask another question. Well, I think what, you know, um, we will have plenty of opportunities to continue our conversation, but I want to get to, um, people's questions. Yeah. Uh, so if we sure. go, there are there are a few of them. Um, and uh, let's I don't know. Do you want to tackle Jennifer's notion yeah, yeah, hallucination? Yeah. Well, let me let, let me first let me first very quickly do like simple questions. Okay. So subject subject seeing is asking me about a large scale visual analysis of pictures. Well, so I published the whole book, right? Cultural Analytics book, which is about it. You know, and there are 43 projects on our website. Uh, uh, you know, if you have a particular question, if you want to analyze some large set of images, just send me an email and I will try to kind of help you. That was one question. The second question from Jane Cooper, why am I mostly using the journey? Yes, I prefer it over Dali because at least the earlier version of the journeys, you know, I think aesthetically it was better. Uh, it's kind of, uh, Dali is kind of designed to give you the kind of, I don't know, very almost uncapitational, very basic photograph, uh, whereas Midjourney sort of somehow learned about the status, composition, you know, color, uh, and things will also have this great equality, at least in version three. Um, okay, and then uh, Jennifer, right? What about hallucinations to the image? Well, uh, I mean, I was under the impression that the term, so the term hallucination was introduced in this famous 2015 kind of paper from you know, Google scientists. Um, and uh, this idea was, right, so we introduced this metaphor of hallucination because in fact, a particular technique we used at the time, right, which was very different from its diffusion uh, models uh, used today, right? You, know, you, would, you would create something which is like an image and then there's like some like repeating patterns. It did look like hallucination. Um, I think uh, I personally don't like it, right? As a general term to talk about uh, AI image or genetic media, because I think it brings again certain sort of romantic notion. So for me, you know, uh, something like probabilistic image, statistical image, latent image is more, a bit more scientific, a bit more dry. So it's a bit less mythologizing. Uh, and uh, also, I think if you look at the kind of logic of these images people are making today using these models, they're actually very different from hallucinating, right? Because you're not saying the same thing everywhere. You know, you basically read the, you know, the computer reads a prompt to make something uh, which can exist or cannot exist, but it kind of follows, right? Somehow it learned from all the human images that there's a ground, there's a plane, uh, there's a free space. You know, so they're like more prosaic. To me, they're too prosaic. They're not hallucination enough. Uh, what other questions? I'm just looking, 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 looking. I don't know. Um, uh, anything else you see? Um, well, certainly, you think you this question yeah. of digital humanities is interesting. Can a human, a computer system, be unbiased? Well, I mean, yeah, okay, maybe I can go. 
or do we best offer different perspectives? Well, I think the answer is that uh, for you know various reasons, uh, not necessarily for evil reasons, the designers of computer systems, right, in our society, because we're afraid that users will get lost, they usually don't open the black box, right? We don't give you lots of options. So you go to YouTube, you go to Instagram, you go to Spotify, you 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 tell your car, right, to chart the route somewhere, and you kind of get like one response, right? And you don't know how you got it. Maybe in the case of car navigation, you have a bit more option. You say, okay, I can have like a more economical route to set gas, so maybe I don't want to take highway. But in the case of like social media, I mean, you just get, right, uh, kind of particular recommendation, and we don't really show you, right, the inside. So I think in the case of generative media, of course, what we want to see is we want to see uh, simpler, more democratic ways to fine tune these models, so more people can fine tune these models. We want to see these companies can kind of audit their data sets, something which we already started doing five years ago in relation to, to general data science, but not in relation to this uh, cultural data sets, what's in it, uh, to kind of publish their biases, to openly say, well, we have a house style, and the house style is going to make like this and like this. And also, to can give you not one model, but to give you lots of models. So again, it's happening a little bit, but not enough. So for example, in journey, we have a general model, and we also have model to generate like Mongo-like images. And we're talking every time, in a new version, we'll have multiple models, we'll have like a, you know, but ultimately, you want more transparency, uh, which is possible despite of the box, and you just want to have alternatives, right? Uh, but that's not what happens, right? Like 20 years ago, we had lots of search engines, even Google kind of became the dominant, right? But it's the history of monopolization in a particular type of economy, we simplistically call capitalist, or it's a bit more than that. Um, so I think it's up to us to pressure these companies. Uh, and uh, to kind of give us more, to give us more variety of tools and to make them more open, at least for professional users as opposed to less, and to kind of simplify, simplify and make it easier for people to fine tune on. Uh, uh, so that's, so I think it's possible and I hope it will happen hmm. or not, or not. So this question yeah. above, um, do you think digital humanities as a discipline, et cetera, take a look at that. Yes, sure. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So around 2005, I felt, you know, you know we talk, right, we, we, the theme of today talk is like this explosion, abandons, right? Scale, even something happens. So I also felt the scale effect in my own work, right? Because uh, in the you know, late 90s, I can go to particular digital art festivals and I know everybody and like there's huge three or four good projects I can write about. In my mid 2000s, it explodes, right? You know, there's processing, you know, and suddenly hundreds of thousands of students using digital tools. And I said, well, you know, <clears throat> how can I look at this, right? So, so I said, romantically, if I'm to continue to be an intellectual who writes about culture of our time, I need to have a new set of tools to look at this. And that's why, uh, I look at digital humanities, which was already developing, but it was not dealing with images. And I invented my own species, right, which I call cultural analytics. Uh, and I spent, I think, way too long trying to do this work and trying to have interesting conversation with digital humanities people. Yes, I did appear as a keynote speaker at the conferences, but eventually I basically got really disappointed. And now I'm happy being artist and talking to more artists because I find Artists are more curious. Uh, artists are more supportive. When I started like showing to people that they're making art again, I got so much support both privately and through Facebook. And uh, I think that when I was doing my cultural analytics work, I don't know, I kind of felt it was a bit like doing it in the world. Uh, like I, I created cultural analytics as a way to say, we need to use computer tools to look at the, you know, this kind of, scaled up visual culture. And eventually with digital humanities, people made a journal called Cultural Analytics, which only publishes articles about text. So um, um, 
And I want to say, well, last thing I want to say is this, right? So we know that, especially in America, it's less so in other countries, humanities have been under attack, right? Because the world is global, everybody competes for the same top jobs, right? Education costs money, at least in this country, <laughs> not so much in Europe, but there's more competition, right? For good jobs, good universities, you know, and uh, people say, why should I spend time, right? Learning humanities. Because before humanities was basically a degree for like rich people. Who was, who was studying art history 100 years ago in New York? You know, rich people, you know, it was not like really for jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the humanities started going down in the 70s because this is when in America, the woman finally can get like a range of white collar jobs. And then they no longer getting humanities degrees. Because before you get humanities degree, you marry your husband and you're done. So this collapse of humanities, you know, has to do with jobs and it's going on since mid seventies. And I think as humanities people getting less and less funding, as opposed to trying to be experimental, as opposed to trying to be crazy, we just become like more and more, I think, uh, kind of like, let's say, closed in and uh, scared and et cetera. And uh, uh, I think at a certain point, the deans and the rectors and presidents of universities thought that it's great, you know, it's going to get us more students. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm, even though like it's, it's flourishing, I think uh, I see so few interesting projects in digital humanities, at least for me, all the best projects in digital humanities are done by media artists, designers, and programmers, not by humanities people. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just me, right? So, so, so I like digital humanities if they're done by artists because I'm interested in digital tools as a way to look at the world in new ways, as a way to look at the history of culture in new ways. And this is sometimes maybe a bit too bold and a bit too crazy uh, for humanities people to do who are still very much about classifications and categories. And you know, we don't, for example, we don't look at Instagram because Instagram is done by normal people, not by professional artists. Like which is what done in history was. So there is too many constraints, I think, for digital humanities to become really interesting. Hmm. So let's look at this last question and and close yes. with that. Oh, sure. Who is an artist in software era? Um. Well, I think I already answered this, but let me. I'm trying to think back and answer for new ways. Um. Well, the artist is, okay, let's put it this way. Uh, the artist, I think, is always a person who initiates something, who decides to do something, even if you simply you know, opening a website and putting like a random string of text and getting images back, you are still one who is doing it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's one thing. And then the second thing, uh, there hasn't been so many great, great artists in history of art. You know, and I will name a few, which I call great, which is not very fair and not very generous. So, you know, Rembrandt and Vermeer and Rubens and uh, uh, I would say Chaim Soutin uh, in the 20th century, Tarkovsky, right? Um, and it seems that so far, despite this huge progress, so to speak, in AI, AI can't really do anything. And I'm, I'm thinking about it, I haven't written about it. If you just look at the Rembrandt drawings, and his amazing kind of freedom and fluidity, right? So sometimes he has lines which go along the shape, and sometimes the lines just go crazy. And like I was going to do it, but I ran out of time, right? Like I made a very basic, just drawing of a cube. And I gave it to AI tools to continue, right? To basically expand, just simply using my, my shading. And I'm not Rembrandt, obviously, but you know, I'm a human being and my shading, you know, it's kind of has a certain randomness to it. And after a while, this expansion became, it completely collapsed, right? It basically gave me something which is still too regular, too predictable. And uh, this is, I think, why we find many of these AI photographs a bit uncanny, They're like a bit too perfect. And what it really means is they're a bit too regular, they're a bit too predictable. And uh, so I think that if you take 99.9999 artists, 
whether we're people on Instagram or people who like show new galleries, obviously AI can do better already, right? Uh, I mean, ChatGPT can generate better concepts and Midjourney can make better images, but not, not the level of, you know, great, great. Uh, and uh, what does it mean for the future of art? Uh, as I said, you know, we, we will never find out because I think art is right kind of structured by the art market, you know, which is, I think, very strong and it benefits everybody. And it's also a market, ultimately, it's a good thing. Because, for example, most painting we saw today is abstract painting, as opposed to this ideological identity painting, identity art, we see, for example, being artist. So art market, I think, right now is a very good thing. So, so we're not going to know, we're not going to know what could happen because we are in this particular art system, uh, right, which is art market slash romantic period slash artist genius, you know, and eventually, right, where some photographers and, you know, like just like today, where some photographers where work is valued and work is sold and, you know, and, but, but actually never, never for as much as painting, right? I don't think there's any photographer today, you know, even most famous 20th century, who cost as much as painting. And in fact, I look at the arts report this morning and 77% of dealers say, you know, the most important category for them is painting. And photography has been around for 150 years. So don't, I don't expect the AI anytime soon to challenge that. Maybe not in my lifetime. And you know what? I'm happy about it. I'm going back to painting uh, because I actually want to have dialogue with Soutine and uh, Borsch. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's something about technological art where it looks amazing and five, five months later, it looks irrelevant. So um, precisely because you expect me to, you know, route for in the promote art, I will do opposite uh, <laughs> because it's more interesting to me. And uh, see you, I hope to see some weird exhibition of my drawings. And this is to me, the news media. Very good. That's best. Okay, Lev, thank you so much. Uh, just for everyone to know, we are going to plan um, a publication based around the algorithmic state talks with Lev with Hito Steyrl, with Zach Blass, with others, and um, uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation, Lev. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for this wonderful context, and uh, you know, see you at all the wonderful art openings, and uh, enjoy the summer, whatever place you are, and uh, for any A tools, don't be afraid that the game with false creativity is still better than nothing. And, uh, you know, uh, we're not going to make any more great artists, but we'll give pleasure to lots of us and we'll feel meaning to people. We give a sense of creativity and that's wonderful. So here's on to AI. All right. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so to much. everyone. All right. Bye.